So, we'll just get started. Hopefully this clicker works. All right, so who am I? Um, you know, you type that into a terminal, you get root, hopefully. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I grew up in Peachy County, and uh, I grew up, I born in Brooklyn, uh, but grew up, <laughs> but uh, we, uh, <laughs> we moved to the West Coast, and there was a massive earthquake, so we moved right back to the East Coast, where there were no earthquakes, and so moved to D.C., and uh, well, PG. Uh, grew up in Clinton, Suitland, Fort Washington, uh, running around crazy over there. Played golf, football, track, basketball, tennis, dodgeball, I don't know, everything else that's under the sun. Um, I volunteer as a high school track coach, uh, both here in Virginia and in Seattle, because I currently live in Seattle. And I also volunteer as a high school entrepreneurship teacher here in uh, oh, Front Royal, Virginia. So, uh, and then I spend my free time somewhere between eating, traveling, uh, and, and somewhere with live music, hopefully all three, like Coachella or something. Uh, so. Uh, my family's here, uh, my sister and my mother, uh, both in uh, Maryland, and they might walk in at some point tonight. And I have a dog with me in Seattle that drives my car on road trips, so uh, he's mad that I've been gone for a while. So really, why am I here? And my reason for being here is that we're all a team, and a lot of people go out in the world and they, they think about, all right, I've got to go do this one thing for myself and build my empire, do that. And really, it's, it's, it's ludicrous for us to imagine that we can go out there and do everything on our own. And that's something that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's said by a lot of people, a lot of successful people are out there, but they, you know, a lot of people claim they can do something by themselves, but they can't. What it takes is a community and you work with each other. Um, and so that being said, it's profoundly difficult for uh, anyone to build a company, let alone uh, a minority, uh, specifically black people, uh, Latin people, and it's, it's hard, it's very hard. And so on top of the 90% or 93% failure rate you have as a first time business owner, a first time uh, founder, you have on top of that all the other uh, variables that are trying to make you fail. And so some of those variables are your sales network, you have to get out there. And so I know there's a lot of consumer businesses out there and they say, oh, we'll make money later, we'll get $80 million in investment. Uh, and I personally had a friend that had to hand back $50 million of investment. So it's not a pretty thing, at least you didn't lose it. But, uh, and so, uh, now funding is another thing that I'll talk about. I'll touch on that. But it's, it is really hard to do that to start with. But on top of that, when uh, people don't, or you don't look like the people you're asking um, for money from, and you don't, you don't have anything in common, them or you don't have much in common with them or they have some kind of issue with you. It's hard to do that. Uh, and then the recruitment network. Uh, a lot of people I, I heard talking went to really good schools and that helped a lot <clears throat> but at the same time you still get the undertone of do I really want to work for that person or they don't look the, the nerdy type or they don't look the tech type so do they, are they really going to uh, run a, real, a, a good business? And so you went into that and uh, now, one of the other things I wanted to share was my experiences as a black entrepreneur. Um, building and running that company, it was the hardest thing that I've had to do. Um, I went to a military school, I went to boot camp every summer, I did lots of hard things. I uh, was all American athlete in college, and by far, uh, this was the hardest thing that I had to do. And you know, you could actually feel it in your body, you could see the changes. Some investors would say, hey, what's I'm like, yeah, I haven't eaten in like three days. So, uh, <laughs> all right, I live off of chili and eggs. So um, now the big thing here is a lot of entrepreneurs talk about, all right, this, it's, this is awesome. I started a company and now I have a yacht, right? Like, and that's not how it goes at all. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into getting from point A to point B to point C. Uh, and we'll cover that. And one other thing I want to say is if, if anyone wants to jump in with a question or interrupt or whatever, just go ahead. Like, it's, uh, I'm up here presenting, giving us something to talk about, but if you have questions and I covered something or blew past something, I'm happy to go back and talk about more of it. So. So how did it start? So my early interests uh, were in my father's payphone business. And he was, uh, if you think about uh, all the payphones that were involved in the D.C. area, he owned about 60 to 70 percent of those. Uh, and that was actually where I actually saw my first issue with a black owned business. And uh, he was, you know, we ran into, we had a lot of run-ins with the police, you, you know, two o'clock in the morning trying to fix a payphone, looks like you're trying to rob it, right? And so uh, as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, I got to see that firsthand. And sometimes the concept of, oh, maybe I should hire someone to be the quote-unquote CEO of this company so that I don't get in trouble or people do business with me because they don't, you know, because of certain racial issues. Uh, so my mother also kept handing me technical stuff. Her first, uh, first time we got a computer, she said, here, make it work. And so I sat there for about nine hours trying to figure out how to open this thing called Windows. So I just started typing the word Windows slowly, and I put W and then I and then enter. It didn't work. That W-I-N, it opened Windows. So I thought I was a hacker. Um, but, you know, 
<laughs> a while to go. But I didn't always have a computer. Um, you know, again, pay phones went downhill, if you remember that too. Uh, my father was from the Caribbean. Uh, he grew up in the jungle, built his own house. And so what he knew was just hustle, hustle, hustle. And so, you know, he kept hustling. Pay phones were going down, his cell phones were coming up. And ultimately, that meant that pay phones went out of business. And so did us. <laughs> and so, you know, we didn't have any money. And so as I'm moving around, I didn't have a computer. So I figured out the library uh, gave you 30 minutes of time on a computer. And I just would rotate my name on that list. And like, haven't you been here for like six hours? Uh, maybe, but <laughs> it's different names on there. So that's how I learned HTML. Uh, I would read the books and then run to the computer. I only had 30 minutes to figure out how to make the web page before it got erased. So um, I had to learn how to write things correctly. And so um, I spent four and a half years at the military school. That's what's in Front Royal, Virginia. It's called Randolph-Macon, if you've heard of it. And uh, that was kind of like a wild west. They had, it was back when Windows 98, Windows 95 was on the network. So there was no security and I could do whatever I wanted. So I uh, got in a little bit of trouble, but it's a military school, so you can't really get in trouble. But, uh, and then I just tried to learn as much as I could. And anywhere I would go, I taught to people. I was playing golf and some guy walked up to me and helped me with my golf swing. He ended up being a software developer and he sent me links galore. Uh, links and links and links just to learn and read things. And so that was a, a huge uh, key. So my professional background, I went to Carnegie Mellon uh, and some of you went there. Uh, at Carnegie Mellon, I built a file sharing network. That file sharing network actually was rolled over from my military school. Um, you had you know, 400 boys and 100 girls in a school and on a shared network, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted with file sharing. And so I rolled that over to Carnegie Mellon where they got uh, about 20,000, 25,000 users on it. And uh, what I would do is during my track meets, I would go and drop off little pieces of paper. Yes, it was littering. Drop off little pieces of paper with the secret password to our, 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 our file sharing network. And we had homework, notes, class recordings, those types of things on it. And eventually it started, they started sharing videos and, and pictures and music and all that other kind of stuff. Uh, that caused a few issues with the recording industry of America. but. We'll glaze over that. And then, uh, so then I parlayed that and um, the, the Nationwide Students Classifieds, which we called front listings. Front listings uh, we built on the file sharing network that we had already because I saw that was about to get sued out, sued out of existence. So uh, we took all of our user base and pushed that over to front listings. And that was a really good way to, to push ourselves, uh, to seed and uh, gain the system and beat the chicken or the egg problem. And I can talk about that in a bit as well. Uh, and then I graduated in 2008 when the stock market was on sale. And uh, so I ended up going to Microsoft because they handed me a paycheck. And, um, and actually the student classifieds, it went head to head with Facebook. There was a, a little bit of um, a hostile uh, action that was taken, a DDoS that was taken against our, our network, our, our servers. And a DDoS is a denial of service attack. That means that if you're, imagine that you're standing there and someone's talking to you. And then that person clones, clones themselves 10,000 times and they're all saying different things to you. That's what happened to our server, which was sitting in my dorm room. So I had no way to scale, no way to do anything. Right now we have AWS. So when that happens on AWS, it'll scale automatically. But back then it was, all right, plug in the other computer and plug in the other computer. And so someone was attacking. Uh, front listings went down. And after it, went down, it was down for X amount of time, people jumped over to Facebook Classified. We lost 75% of our user base in uh, about a day and a half. And so um, I had to get a job. <laughs> and so, uh, and so uh, I started working in the Microsoft IT department. Uh, it was also it was like this middle ground between SharePoint and IT. And we basically just got to build prototypes of things we thought made sense. And then while I was doing that, I built something called, uh, called Wink, which I will, if we have time, I can run through. I have a little deck on that. But Wink was uh, an image crawling and re-exification re algorithm. And what it did was uh, if you did a picture of you in 2008, uh, before all this uh, image stuff was out, you would go out, it would go out on the web and find every picture of you and then bring it back and tell you where it found every picture of you. And it couldn't, obviously it couldn't remove them because that would involve some illegal stuff, but um, it would tell you where those things are. And so we uh, went up the chain and actually what I did, uh, I was a college hire sitting in a room like this and I asked, it was a corporate vice president. She said, if anyone has ideas, you know, we're all about ideas. And so I raised my hand. I was like, well, my roommate and I worked on this thing and uh, we don't know what to do with it. Because at Google, if we come up with something and it gets a certain amount of users, we get a million dollars. But at Microsoft, we just, we get in trouble. So what do we do? So she said, send me an email. And I was like, all right, what do you want in the email? She said, give me a summary and a, you know, a couple screenshots and, and we'll, look, we'll see what happens. And so we'll see what happens meant that uh, the next morning I was going to the gym at 5 a.m. And I see her forward the email off to Bill Gates, Steve Ballmer, the entire C-level suite, and then the entire, all their reports. And then immediately, I guess they're on the, their planes around the country or the world, they start emailing me back. And so I call my roommate, I turn around, wasn't going to the gym, turn around and call my roommate. He's like, I see it, I see it, just, are you coming home? I'm like, yeah, I'm coming home. We took off of work for the next day and a half. 
and we just responded to emails. And um, so for uh, about two years at Microsoft, I had two jobs and I was working 16, 18 hours a day um, on this, or, or excuse me, on SharePoint, and the other part was on the image crawling. And uh, you know, we were all over the country doing that. We, you know, we got to pitch and meet a lot of people. Uh, some were nice, some weren't. Uh, the current CEO, I'm gonna just not talk about him. So, uh, but, but what ended up happening was I met an entire pillar of people that were, that were like, hey look, Microsoft isn't in this world of let's innovate right now, um, and, but we're gonna, we're gonna help you. And so at first I thought about it and I said, hey, I, you know, I'm, I, I went to the racial side of things. I said, hey, I'm a black guy trying to come in here and do some, make some changes and they don't wanna see me. And what it really was, it was some, some up, or high level battle that was going on where Steve Ballmer and his people were trying to uh, take over the company, but Bill Gates' people wanted to take over the company and Bill Gates wasn't there anymore. Uh, well, he wasn't you know, involved anymore, so he didn't have any power. And there was a struggle and I walk in saying, hey, can someone you know, run my app? And that didn't work out too well. But I ended up meeting, that was the best experience because I ended up meeting all the executives that then helped me get out of there uh, and, and helped me leave. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so I, then I left and did a little consulting uh, I was just urged to leave uh, and, and people kept giving me hints, you know, our, the consultants that we hired, they said, hey, you know, if you left Microsoft, you could make three times more. And not that I would say that you should ever. And so it turns out that's what they were trying to tell me to do for like a year and I kept ignoring it. And uh, so I left and did that. I realized I was still working for a corporate company and receiving a paycheck and I wanted to make the paychecks. And uh, so right now I'm currently in the world of cybersecurity at a company called Polyverse. And Polyverse is a cybersecurity firm that's run by uh, Bill Gates' uh, former technical advisor. And he's one of my, been my personal advisor since I was 22. Uh, and he just made a, a nice pitch to me to learn something that I didn't already know. And so again, I can touch on that in a little bit. But uh, the big question here is why did I start my own company? And this is an email from my sister that she would send me every single day from 2009 onward until I quit Microsoft. And it says, my life has been reduced to email and meetings. This is not fun. Seriously, I'm considering a complete change of career, maybe being a jet pilot. I only have one life. I need to do something I enjoy where I have some promise, not 15 layers of executives above me that trickle things down. I'm grateful to have an income, yes, but I don't get excited about the work we do. No one does. It's IT. These guys are here to be stable and make money to support their families. Nobody has the drive to change the world on this team. And that's what Microsoft was all about back then. It was people were just trying to maintain and, and, and toe the line. They weren't trying to make any waves. And that's actually what several executives said to me. Um, and in my description for, you know, for this meetup, you know, I, I was invited to dinners, I was invited to people's houses, I was invited to places to sit down and talk to them. And, uh, and it opened up my eyes to a lot of things. They said, you know, one of the, the director of Microsoft Research sat me down, he said, I like what you're doing, I'm supporting you, but I'm telling you the other people are not supporting you because they have been here for 20 years. Now they have kids going to college, and if they make any waves, that messes with their college fund. It's not, it's not something I thought about ever, right? You know, I was the 20 year old kid trying to make waves. And so, you know, my sister kept sending this to me and saying, hey, I sent you an email, it's time to do something about it. And so, I, my first foray was I started a consulting firm with a couple good friends of mine, and uh, we messed up. We tried to get a couple <coughs> contracts, and we failed at all of them. And you know we just you know we didn't realize that consulting isn't just about writing a good or writing a good uh, response to the RFP. It's about knowing people and being able to prove that you're not going to mess up their business. And so the big thing here, I was upset. I had to go back to work, and I wasn't going to go have a yacht in a year. So I, I had, I, but I learned lessons, right? And I said, all right, I fail, I fail. In sports, when you fail, you figure out what not to do. And so. I then started Time Technologies Inc. in 2011, and actually it was called Tartan Soft, and so that's uh, it was uh, the Tartans are the name are the name of our mascot in at Carnegie Mellon, and uh, software. So that wasn't very innovative, but uh, <laughs> but it was called Tartan Soft, and it was an LLC, and we named it that because Carnegie Mellon had opened up a new uh, accelerator program. And they said that they were trying to get people in. And uh, my co-founders, uh, one was uh, Seek, and we had a, a very unhappy, um, uh, touchy, uh, large white guy. And so we were like, we have a very diverse set of people. And, and so the only, we were missing a woman, but uh, we figured we can find one of our friends to jump in. So, uh, but the whole thing here is there was more failure involved here. What happened was is we, we met, went out, met with a bunch of investors, got a lot of promises from people. And then Carnegie Mellon took a long time to, uh, uh, actually, so the fund was if you could find uh, a minimum of $100,000 investment, they would match that investment. And we went out and found 250,000. And so we're celebrating, we quit our jobs. I put in my, you know, I said I was gonna, told Microsoft I was gonna quit. And then our matching, our, our lead investor pulled out, meaning all the money was gone. 
And so I'm sitting there, all right, well, I quit Microsoft, I have no job, I have nothing, and we have no money now, so what do we do? And uh, to keep going down that rabbit hole of bad things happening, that same day that I quit Microsoft, the left side of my face was shattered. It's completely shattered uh, by someone playing flag football with me. And so I couldn't see out of my left eye, I couldn't talk, I couldn't eat, and I couldn't even stand up, and I couldn't think straight because there were, there were bones all over the place. And then I, had, I was sitting there looking at a $40,000 surgery bill. Um, luckily, I got to the hospital at 11.51 p.m., and so my insurance covered it. Uh, but it, you know, it was a, I was sitting there saying, maybe I shouldn't have quit my job. Maybe I should have just stayed at Microsoft. And I'm sitting there, and my friends were like, no, you'll get over it, but just stop hurting yourself. <laughs> stop putting yourself in these situations. And so as time went on, uh, I ended up selling my company to 7 and B Technologies Corporation. And the sale was, was architected by one of the executives that I'll talk about, the former executives from Microsoft. He used to run the entire Windows division. He invented Windows CE. Um, all the, you, you've all probably touched the software and hardware that he's built. And uh, I actually went to his office when I first met him in 2009, and he was building a tablet uh, before the iPad came out. And he was sitting there, what, what do you think of this? And I'm like, I just met you, and you handed me a tablet, which is futuristic. <laughs> and so this guy, and he's super smart, and he calls me one day, and he says, hey, I think I have a high net worth individual that wants to buy your company. And I was like, why would they want to buy my company? And he said, well, several reasons. You have a good team, you have a product that they want to build, that you've already built and done the work on, and they, just want to, and they have more money than you, and they just want to give you the money so that they don't have to do the work. And that's exactly what happened. They wanted to take us, take my team, they wanted to, and they asked you know, certain uh, questions, certain hard questions. Do you need the, the, all the members of your team? Which would have meant that I would have gotten a lot more money if I said no. But I said, every, every one of my team comes with me or we, none of us go. And not everyone does that. Um, and I was told in college by one of my entrepreneurship professors that you'd have to make that decision. And I did, it came up and, and I, you know, your team is what makes you. And that's what I said at the beginning, we're all a team and we all work together. And so while I think I architected all that stuff myself, I didn't, I bounced ideas off of people and that's how, how things worked. So um, after that, I started Raindrop Corporation in 2016. Uh, it's something that'll pop up. I guess if you look me up, it might pop up here and there, but it's something that we're not making publicly uh, publicly known uh, what it actually does or is until uh, later this year. And that's for legal reasons, that's for people who are still attached to it that they can't talk about what they do, they can't tell, they'd get in trouble, they get sued. So um, that's something that you might see. So again, why, why did I start my own company? Um, you know, my job at Microsoft, was it cushy? No. Actually, people were getting laid off left and right. A lot of my friends were getting laid off. Uh, I was getting, uh, because of the politics that were happening when I was meeting these executives, I'd have to you know, skip out on a team meeting to go meet with Steve Ballmer, right? And that just sounded arrogant. And so my managers did not like that at all. And uh, luckily, so I kept getting bad reviews at Microsoft because of whatever reason they would come up with. Luckily, one of my uh, mentors was the CTO of Microsoft. So he'd see it come through and flag it and then like send it back down. And it was just these lucky, not lucky, but these, um, I don't know, there's just these things that kept happening that, that made it so that, you know, if they weren't there, I would have been totally screwed, you know? So, um, now, the Microsoft executives that continually urged me to take the risk and leave, um, Alice Canaris, who's the CEO of Polyverse right now, Barry Briggs, who's the CEO that I just talked about, Bill Mitchell was the one who I mentioned uh, used to run Windows and architected the sale of my company. And then Kostas Malios, who sat on a call, he, he was in charge of mergers and acquisitions for Microsoft. And he called me and told me that image, that image stuff that you built, you had to leave it at Microsoft, let it simmer for a while, and you know, maybe you can take it out again, patent it, and sell it. But you have enough ideas in your head that you can go do something else. And I was in massive debt, I was broke. And I'm like, well, dude, you make $2 million a year. That's easy for you to say. And, and he was driving to like, Spin house or something when he was on the phone with me. So I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. And he's like, well, if you are gonna be 30 plus and start this business, right now you're 23, 24, you know, you're gonna have a lot more, uh, um, a lot more constraints that are, that are there. You might have kids, you might have a wife, you might have all types of things, health issues. Right now you're fine, it's a money issue, we can worry about money, we can find money. I'm like, okay, we can find my money, <laughs> find me some money, but all right, he's like, we can find that. But what he really meant was, all of these people, yeah, he makes $2 million a year, these people made more than him, meaning all of their friends make more than them, meaning a $100,000 investment is really nothing, right? And so, we're, they were basically saying, we will introduce you and walk you into rooms with high net worth, high net worth individuals, and that's what they did. Um, my first, I embarrassed all of them on my first meetings. You know, I walk in and I didn't know things. Um, in my first investor, investor meeting, the guy was just like, okay, stop. I'm gonna turn this into a teaching moment, but we're not putting any money in that company. And so, but it was a teaching moment. And again, I took that as a positive, right? So, um, you know, the challenge was intimidating, it was, it was appealing. 
Um, but I knew that I'd learn a lot. And again, failure, learning a lot from failure is what we do. And then um, the big thing though is I wanted to make money. And so um, I like fun coupons, but <laughs> so don't be shy about wanting to make money. Uh, now obviously minorities are underrepresented in the world of technology. And um, this is a number or a graph that's really gonna show you how, how bad it is. Uh, so 73% of senior leadership in tech is white. And uh, there's some more numbers I'll talk about um, how many of those are white males. And then 21% are Asian, which includes Indian and uh, East Asian, yep. The teaching, oh, from uh, the investors. Um, they were the guys that run Wells Fargo for the West Coast. They, uh, it was about the deck and it was about how we were presenting the deck. It was just like, we were just bad. <laughs> it was like, like, don't come in here with like eight million slides. And, um, and he said, yeah. And he also, oh, that's the other big thing they asked us. He said, what's, a, what's your cap table look like? And uh, the cap table is a capitaliz capitalization table. And it shows just basically it's a list of, you know, this person owns this percent, this person owns that percent. And I sat there and I looked at my, my friend or my, my co-founder who worked at Goldman Sachs and I'm just like, please tell me you know something with that. He looks at me, he's like, oh, we don't know what that is. <laughs> and and that, that, that was actually when he was just like, okay, stop. <laughs> so, I mean, I did a lot, Wikipedia, I did a lot of Wikipedia um, uh, college, if you will. And, uh, and, and one of the actual interesting things was one of my friends went into uh, start her MBA when I was starting the company. And so I was asking her a lot of questions. And then by the end, she was asking me a lot of questions. And so it was like I went and got an MBA. Um, and she finished about when I sold my company. So it worked out well. Uh, and so yeah, this is, I mean, this is a huge percentage. White and Asian make up a massive percentage of this, which means that 3% uh, Latino, 2% black. And then <clears throat> obviously, you have the other mixed race and Pacific Islander which is pretty crazy, right? So, um, so more numbers. 78% of top VC team members are white. 30% of the top 71 VC firms are 100% white. It's 30%. That means they like, probably don't even talk to 15% of them. And then black and Latin leadership um, is both at 1% for VC firms. So that, that means, um, well, let's talk about this. All but two of my investor meetings out of the entire time I've been doing pitching since 2010 uh, were to white males. That's two out of all of those. I don't even know the percentage was, but I met and pitched with over 75% of the top USVC firms. And so I go in there and I don't look like them. Yep. What year is this data from? Uh, 2016, or sorry, 2017. Yeah, <clears throat> it's from, uh, I have it in the notes, but yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's Fortune maybe, um, but yeah, so, and this is a, it's a crazy number here. And so, I mean, I was looking down the list and I got this number here just because I was looking down the list, you know, when I saw that number and I was like, man, I've talked to, and I counted and I was like, I talked to all these people. And it was frustrating. Some of the, one of the worst um, uh, responses that I got from a, an investor was, uh, uh, oh, he, he goes, did you, did you go to Burning Man? And I was like, no, I couldn't afford to go to Burning Man. It was like $5,000 to go. And I'm trying to start a company. He goes, oh, okay, we only talk to people who have been to Burning Man. And I'm like, and that was a major firm. <laughs> I said, it's a major Silicon Valley firm. And, and I mean, I like all kinds of music. I've been to everything pretty much but Burning Man, but I can't go in the middle of a desert for $5,000 and not do work. It doesn't make sense, right? So you get people like that. Um, yep. What's the age range? It's, it's a mix. There's uh, the youngest person that I talked to, uh, and I'll just, I don't even care. It was Madrona Venture Firm. Uh, Madrona, Madrona, they're based out of Seattle. And uh, he was 22, but he was straight out of college, maybe 23, uh, straight out of college. And he, so what I do, and one thing to always keep in mind is when you hand out and send files to people, I never attach things directly. I send links that I can track. And so I sent him a link uh, via attached.io. He said, we sat down with him for a two hour meeting, talked all these questions. He was kind of arrogant, but fine. I actually knew the, the heads of the, the managing directors. I talked to all of them before, but I was trying to go through and not you know, go through that route. I was trying to go the correct route. And um, <clears throat> he said to me, he was, uh, he was, was, he was Chinese, um, but he said to me, <clears throat> he said, I, I don't think we're interested in your, in your team. And it was something, not that those exact words, but then he said, um, he said, send me the deck and I'll circulate it with the rest of, the, with the, rest of the, the company. And I sent him the deck, he never opened it. And then I emailed him, I was like, hey, what'd you think of the deck? And he goes, oh, I shared it with a bunch of people and we're not interested, never opened it. And I have a tracker, I can see when you opened it, when you, what slides you look at, how long you look at them, where your mouse is, all of that. And I know it works because it's not my company, it's another company. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's what their company does. 
And I'm sitting there like, that's crazy. And uh, I, you know, I sent an email to the managing director and told him that. Uh, and the kids, he's no longer with Madrona. But it's, it's things, people do things like that. And if I didn't have the ability to go and do that, um, you know, and, and get him out of there, you might have met some other people that would have turned, you know, turned them off from Madrona. And so, uh, but the age range, I've talked to people that were in their 70s, uh, 80s. And they are, uh, oddly enough, I didn't know this until two years ago, but the person who gave me a scholarship to go to military school, had, I mean, he's, he's so started and sold over 40 companies, bought companies. He brought the Cleveland, Cleveland Cavaliers to uh, Cleveland, uh, everything. I had no idea. I just thought this guy was just giving me tuition to go to this school. But he invited me to his house, and he introduced me to more investors, the people that, uh, the one guy who, has, who was the creator of Bluetooth, um, all, just all types of stuff. And so... It's, it's um, a whole spectrum of people. You have people who are really young, who are 18 years old, whose parents left them with a bunch of money. And they're, you, know, you talk to them, and they've got you know, $50 million to put somewhere. right? And so um, thanks for the questions, though. I like those. Yep. What do you think has been most beneficial for you in networking to meet all these people? That What's the most beneficial? In, in networking, um, for you to meet all these people and be able to do the things that you can do now? Um, I just run my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, so, like John John Legear, the T-Mobile CEO, I literally was walking into uh, my office building, and he was standing there in a bright pink. You know, he just bright pink everything, and I'm like, I know you. He's like, you sure about that? <laughs> and we just start talking, <laughs> and um, and you know, he was looking for a restaurant. I helped him find it, and that's how like, you, and then you make sure you connect with them, right? And then uh, the Starbucks CEO, I, I noticed he was taking pictures and or doing like a a live stream while I was at a GeekWire event, and nobody recognized him. So, I just walked up, started talking to him. And then we start talking, and he knows he knew the CEO of Polyverse, and then we, all of a sudden, email chain, chain starts happening. Um, Steve Ballmer, I, the first time I met him, uh, I was leaving, uh, I, know, I was leaving some event, but he was going to use a porta potty. And so, and so he comes out of the porta potty, I'm like, hey, how's it going? And one of my other buddies from PG was standing there, standing there with me, and we both and we just started talking to him. So it's all about talking to the people, but also making sure you take that extra step to connect with them and make yourself memorable. So always having something that you can say, oh, yeah, there's this, there's that, and they'll remember you. And then you know, try to bounce yourself. And, and most of the time, they, they're just really busy. But the other thing is, you know, if you are really interesting, they'll sit down and have lunch with you. And they'll sit down and invite you to something. Or um, one of them, uh, Bill Mitchell, I, I ran track. His daughter started running hurdles. I coach hurdles. And so he started sending me nonstop pictures of his daughter, like, how, you know, how'd she do this? Here's a video. What's she doing wrong? And I'm like, you know, critiquing her form and all this other stuff. But that helped me get in, you know, into more of his graces. I think he already liked me a lot. But he, I got into more of his graces because of something that we had in common. right? So um, now this right here, this has been up for a minute. But there's no black women among the Fortune 500 CEOs, which is kind of insane. And um, the only black women to ever be on the list uh, stepped down in 2009. And 92% of the, the senior leadership at top VC firms are men. And then 44 out of the 71 top funds have zero female senior investment leaders, which is a lot. <laughs> and so what does that really mean for women in, in tech entrepreneurship? You know, again, you go into a room, and, and we've all heard about the issues that happened and all the fallout last year and the year before that. Right? It was a whole bunch of problems and people, not, you know, people stepping out of line and causing issues. And so uh, it makes it a lot harder for you to go out there and raise money. It makes it a lot harder for you to go and, and get continued money and to build your business, to get business, all those types of things. But I think for women, that's starting to change a lot because there are a lot of the men in the VC firms in Silicon, Va Silicon Valley have gotten into trouble. Um, so, yeah, uh, just in case people might not have heard of what happened mm -hmm. a few years ago, I'm assuming you're talking about like, the Google Manifesto. So there was the Google Manifesto, but um, the Google Manifesto was a developer at Google, or whatever he was. But he basically was like an anti-diversity rant. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, and he basically was saying that there's an attack on uh, white males or something like that um, because of diversity. Um, what I was talking about was uh, there was a lot of sexual harassment going on amongst VCs in, I mean, amongst all industries now, right? But amongst VCs in particular uh, in Silicon Valley, I, I can't remember if it was 2016 or 2017, but uh, that caused a surge in people correcting themselves and catching themselves and kicking a lot of the, the people out who were causing issues. And you actually started to see a little bit of a rise in and uh, women getting you know, more funding because the, you know, the people that were messing things up weren't there. So, um, so why are minorities underrepresented? Uh, underrepresented? So one thing that I've, I've noticed is the employee versus employer mentality. Uh, and that's something I came out of. Uh, and again, coming from this area, when I do business in this area, I go to a lot of meetups and talk to people and just sit there and listen. <clears throat> and 
a lot of people are afraid to step out there, and I'll touch on that in a moment. The other big thing was IT versus software architecture. Um, and you know, I've, it's, it's fun when I meet an Uber driver or a Lyft driver or whatever, and they, you know, they ask what I do, they start talking, and they say, hey, I want to get into IT. And I tell them, IT is being automated. You know, IT and physical IT is being automated. It's about software architecture, cloud architecture. Learn those terms and go after those terms. And for some reason, it's, it's, it's in our community of, of minorities, it has been heavily focused on IT as opposed to the other words that I, was heard, I heard being tossed around tonight, which I was really excited to hear. But I mean, to me, little words and little mental shifts make a big difference. Um, another big thing was, for example, a little example is, uh, when I go to Canada, Canadians, I found, at least in Vancouver, have, they re refer to themselves as Canadian first and then their ethnicity second. And so that makes them all united. And, and I feel way better when I go to Canada. I just feel like people have treated me so much better than even in Seattle. And I, you know, I, I focus on little things like that. And those little differences can make a huge difference. So, um, and so, again, stepping outside of comfort zones and then the fear of failure because uh, of more severe consequences. Again, if I messed up, and I fail, I didn't have any money, then that means like the family doesn't have money, right? And so there was no, no golden parachute, there was no fallback. Evan Spiegel's dad already made 50 million a year or whatever he made, right? So that's easy. Let me go make an app. If I fail, I'll just go back to my you know, yacht. <laughs> I don't know. I like yachts, whatever. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, it's a fear of failure, and that was my fear. And, and at some point, I'd say, forget it. You know, Microsoft's getting on my nerves. Everything's getting on my nerves. I'm going to go do my thing. And if I fail, I'll just figure something out. I'll be a janitor or whatever. And then, so the other big thing here is to remember, I know probably a lot of you have heard this, but the average of the five people with whom you spend the most time, that's, you, know, you, you are the average of that. And so if you surround yourself with people that are doing really well, I surrounded, you know, my, my roommates were all doing really well. And they were, you know, I, I surrounded myself with them all the time. And uh, my friends, you know, I picked and choose who I was hanging out with. And, and so if you're, you have really, really successful friends who are working their butts off to do something, you're going to go and try to do those same things because you'll see that they're possible. And I saw the same thing in sports, right? If you go to a really good school, the reason why I was an All-American in college was not because I was faster than somebody or I went to a better school. It's because everyone used the same track. So Univers University of Pittsburgh, Duquesne, Cal UPenn, all of them went to the same track. And so we had like five D1 coaches coaching everybody. And so you know, we, we, we were surrounded by these really good people. And so I'd had these workouts that I was doing, thinking I was doing a lot. And then here comes everyone else doing three times that. And I'm like, I guess I won't die if I do that. And so it, it worked, right? And so that's something that, I, um, that I've found is, is something to keep in mind. Uh, also, the other big thing here is uh, for those of you in your 20s and early 30s, you know, partying is huge. You know, people go out and they rage. I, I, I like to party, but at the same time, you might have five people, that, that's all they do. And so if you're trying to go home and spend your entire week in writing code, and everyone's like, hey, you know, come out, come do this, come do that, and next thing you know, it's Sunday night and you're still hungover. I mean, it's not going to help. Whereas you have four friends that are like, no, I'm staying in today because I got to do this. I'm working on this deck. I sent you the deck, you know, take a look at it. And you're going to stay inside and do your work. And so it's really easy to see that play out. The big thing in my mind was it's the entire system rigged. I always thought it was rigged. I thought everything was rigged. Uh, and it is. So, uh, spoiler. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, work for the government, work until, you know, 30 years and become a GS-15 mm -hmm. at $100,000, or you should become a lawyer, you should become a doctor. Yeah. I feel like in our community, that's still very, you know, we're, we're, we're just, we don't have generational wealth or anything like that. Yep. We don't come from trust funds, so our dads and our moms aren't, you know, the heirs of jets and planes. Yeah. And we don't get those type of things where we're getting told to think outside of the box. So yeah. How does, you know, especially everybody in the room, but even then, because they're Yeah. 
Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I was in that boat because uh, I, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon when I was younger. I had like my pajamas were all surgeon clothes, and I read surgeon books. I did all. I was ready to be a neurosurgeon. I also was ready to go into the Navy. That was my other big thing. I wanted to be in the Navy. So my family was like, "Oh, you be a surgeon in the Navy? Oh my, this is everything." And so, uh, but then uh, the war broke out in 2004, and then I was in the military school, so that stuff happened. And then I started looking at how long it took to become a neurosurgeon, how much money it took, and all this other stuff. And I realized that computers were modeled after uh, the, the way the human body and brain works. And so I said, so I can mess up and play around on this computer all day and not get sued, but, uh, but still, get the, the, uh, uh, still get the satisfaction of working on something that, that's kind of like a system. I can build AI and have it think like a human. And, and it's not a human, but it, it thinks like a human. And my mother, um, when I graduated from Carnegie Mellon uh, and got my job, she said, <laughs> she said uh, if I had known, I, I'm not going to, it's not exact quote, but basically if she had known that you can make as much as you can. What, so at Microsoft, my starting salary was 70 grand a year in 2008. I think now it's like 110. But, um, but uh, she said, if I had known you could make this much right out of college, I probably would have told you to do this too. But she didn't know, right? And if you can sit there and say, hey, look, this is possible if I do this, this, and this. Here's my plan. I feel like you're, you know, that's selling. That's what sales is. It's you're trying to sell them on what you want to do. Um, I didn't want to go to college. My mom and sister tricked me into going to college. And uh, she, she brought me there on Carnival Weekend. And Carnival Weekend is kind of this partying weekend. And my sister's six feet tall. And so she's like, hanging out with all like, the people who do modeling. And so I come from military school. She sends me to class with like, you know, two models who are uh, doing computer science and game theory. And I'm just sitting there just like, and everyone's paying attention to me. And I'm just like, what is happening? And then there's parties. And I'm like, this is college? It wasn't, that wasn't college. But, <laughs> but that's what I thought it was. And so, but you know, my, my sister and my mom played a huge influence on me, um, you know, changing my mom's mindset uh, and because you know I wanted to be the neurosurgeon I wanted to do this and I, I was able to do all these different things but I chose this computer route which really seemed like I was most of the time I was just hacking around and getting in trouble but um, once she realized that there is an opportunity to make this money really quickly and easily I mean even now the barrier to entry is really low right you can go make a mobile application and people like it because it plays a radio in a certain loop and you make you know two million dollars over a weekend and so it's possible to do those things, but showing the possibilities. You know, being a neurosurgeon is not, you know, you can, you can make it all the way through neurosurgery school, and then you, you, you get the, the thing that happened to me. I lost my, my I had 2010 vision, but I lost it for a good five months. I was, everything was blurry. And so that could happen to you. Someone could just run into you. You know, there's all types of things, all types of risks. You know, real estate crashed. All these things are, are not uh, 100%. And like I said, you know, I thought, everyone thought I had a cushy job. Why are, you, why are you quitting Microsoft? Microsoft had their first layoffs ever in 2009. And so it wasn't safe. You know, it, you know, I knew Microsoft was not going anywhere, but you know, it, it wasn't safe. It, didn't, it wasn't as safe as you think. So it's all about selling the people who are supporting you. And I think that's it. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, on, a, on a wildly different kind of tangent, um, you mentioned a lot of mentors. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of people who, one, aren't already in the system, who aren't already in uh, the tech industry, so for example, we're pivoting into um, tech careers um, who do not have that built-in system with mentors, how do you suggest going about and finding people who are willing to kind of mentor you? So um, one, it's, it's looking at, uh, that's a good question. So it's talking, again, talking to people that you meet, even if they're, it's like little breadcrumbs. You follow these breadcrumbs. And it's, um, <clears throat> like for, I'll tell you an example. There's a, I, my, my dog, when I go out and walk him, I meet people. And this, uh, this woman I met is in, she's trying to get into taxonomy, which is library science. And it just so happened, I worked with a bunch of library science people at Microsoft. But we talked every day, and then she asked me what I did, I asked her what she did, and then set, go separate ways. And it just keeps building like that. And all of a sudden, it's, we found this link that now that she's going to go talk to two or three of the library science people that probably are going to get her a job at Microsoft, right? Um, but then when, you, when she goes and meets those people, it's a, hey, do you have time to grab coffee real quick? You know, you talk for, you know, talk for an hour and then go away. And then you notice that person likes to, I don't know, plant flowers or under, underwater basket weave, right? And so you go and you do that. Um, and it's, it's, it's a slow process, but even with these execs that liked me, you know, I went, I didn't drink beer, I never drank beer, but uh, Bill Mitchell loved beer. He has a beer brewing company, it's called Pico Brew, it's really good. Um, but it's a beer brewing company, so I went out to get beers with him all the time. And I ended up starting to like beer because he liked expensive beer. But, <laughs> but, but going out with him and going and doing those little steps helped. And, you know, if I was someone in the neighborhood, I would have met him by walking a dog or, you know, he, he, um, 
paddle boards, right? But just meeting every person, and like I was saying, taking every opportunity to, to meet someone and just talk to them. Uh, you know, someone who's trying to get into business, John Laguerre, right? You go up and meet him, oh, I recognize you, then all of a sudden you might have, he might give you a tip on something, or he might introduce you to an exec who likes to mentor. So um, it's all about taking the opportunities and just talking to people. And even at groups like this, you know, talking to people like Taylor, right? Like you just go get up, go talk, and then you can, you can then follow those breadcrumbs and meet people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It would be a little bit different. So, right here, so it's a bit like for you sometimes the advice you get, like, is it a 50 50 split of Yeah. Yeah, so is it, you're asking, is it for me? Uh, yeah, so I was so I was at uh, the Going Away party for Bill Mitchell, and I was talking to, it was a group of execs that were standing there, and this guy, Bob Muglia, uh, he runs uh, Snowflake Computing now. Uh, he starts talking about telling me what kind of cars I should look into. And I'm like, okay, well, I have the Impala 1LT or 2LT, whatever. He's like, you don't have the SS edition? And he's like, well, you know, I know a great Ferrari dealership. And I'm like, yeah, I don't even know that, well, how much that even costs. <laughs> I just know I can't afford it. And, but yeah, I mean, you, you listen to what they say, but at the same time, you can take that and archive it because it might actually help at some point in the future, right? Not the Ferrari thing, but like he might have something else that he, um, that he puts out there and, and it might be relevant later. Um, uh, one thing that I will say for the women in here, uh, one of my best friends, Janet Perez, she uh, you know, she's works heavily in the minority community. Um, she was CS out of Brown. She's one of the, I call her power, power, power woman. It's a hard word to say, her power. Um, so she is really, really good. And she started a uh, company called Present.co, and it's for social networking with women and trying to just help build that community so that people can have mentors and things like that. So she's done a really good job with it, and she launched it with the former CTO of Square. Um, and again, him, I met him at brunch, like we were brunching and we started talking and he introduced me to a ton of investors, right? So. There's an interesting, uh, actually it was, it was funny, I was just talking to Alex Gunares, we had a call, uh, I had to rush over here, and I told him I was coming here to, to, to this talk, and he was just like, wait, I'm, wait what, what are you, what are you talk, talking about me about? And I'm like, just don't worry, it's fine, you helped me get out of Microsoft. And, and it's, it's interesting, he said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna try to paraphrase what he said, he said, it's not like there's any machine code out there that says, you know, you have to be this color, and this age, and this height, and this size, and this whatever, for, in order for your code to work. And that, that's what he told me about an hour, hour and a half ago. And that was really, really powerful to me because that's true. It's not like you put in code, compile it, and then all of a sudden it says, oh no, you're the wrong type, I can't, I don't work, right? Um, you know, you, you can get out there. So my best employee, uh, we worked on some speech recognition software. My best speech employee was, uh, uh, her name was Kelly, and I call, her, I call her the pizza lady because I was trying to work on some speech recognition software. 
and I ordered pizza. I hadn't eaten in the entire day. I ordered pizza and she shows up to my door. She was 47, she might be mad at me for saying this, but she's 47, 48, but she had a PhD in speech recognition um, with, uh, excuse me, PhD in, li in linguistics with a uh, specialization in speech recognition. And my code wasn't working with, for the speech recognition stuff. So she hands me the pizza and we start talking about some Pittsburgh stuff. And I, it just so happens it comes out that she had that degree. And so I'm like, do you, it's not, I'm not being weird, but do you have time to come in my house and look at my code? <laughs> and she stands there, she's like, yeah, this is all wrong. This is all wrong. This is all like, can you come in on Monday then? And she's like, yeah. And so we hired her. Because, I mean, it's, it's the opportunity. And it's about finding the person that, that, and now she's working for Nuance Technologies, which is what powers Siri and all this other stuff. But um, it's about finding, you know, the, just again, taking those opportunities. And the people who actually need you won't care. Um, and, you know, if someone has time to say, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that, then obviously they don't have, they have too much time. So, um, but again, also it's, you know, sometimes it might take you to get out there and do something uh, on your own to just, just take the initiative and run your own thing. Um, and I mean, that's, it's, it's hard uh, to see that now because back, you know, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, no one cared if you had a degree in tech. It was just how, how good are you and get in there and do it. Um, there's one other thing I'll say is a lot of the base level coding stuff is, is, is being considered now blue collar, which means that those, are gonna, those jobs are going to be automated in a decade or so, which means that if you can get yourself to say a cloud architect level or a, a cloud, you know, some sort of architecture level, um, and you can go very niche really quickly and get there, um, learn some AWS real, stuff real quick and get certified, people are going to snap you up and hire you because even if they don't feel, a, they feel a certain way about you, they, you know, your skills uh, overshadow that, you know, that feeling of whatever they feel. And then all of a sudden you start getting a lot of um, experience. And the other thing is uh, work for charities. So I work with a charity right now uh, and we pull in a lot of people who just want experience. And we don't care if they're good or bad, we'll get them there. And no one cares, you're just trying to help, right? And so charity people aren't, they'll, they'll let you, you know, come in and do whatever and it pads your resume like crazy. So, does that help? Okay. So, like I said, the system is rigged, so rig it for yourself. And um, the big thing here is know your weaknesses and be okay with your weaknesses and then find someone who has those as, strength, as strengths. And then study and read everything. Like some people gloss and they might read a little bit of stuff, but read everything and go through it. Yeah, it's gonna take you forever, but read as much as you can. And then something that Alex Kipman told me, Alex Kipman was the inventor of the Connect, and he was, that was a really rude meeting. He got up and left and my roommate and I were like, that, I, I just wanna go home and sleep. <laughs> Exactly. We looked at our image technology because, again, the Kinect back then was just coming out, and we were like, if we can get people's images and start scanning, we can do all types of crazy things. And he's like, yeah, this is interesting, but not really that interesting. In fact, it's uninteresting to me. And I'm like, why? Okay. And he said, solve the hard problem. He said, my hard problem, again, he likes to talk about himself, but my hard problem was creating video games or making a video game controller without a controller. And I was like, yeah, that is actually kind of hard. So, uh, so I took that to heart and went back and built that re algorithm that uh, we had built. Previously, it was more just like an advanced Instagram, but then we built that algorithm because of what he told us. And so get out there and solve the hard problem, and then you're going to game the system because you're really actually solving hard things. And then again, this is what I've been saying the whole time. Every time you speak to someone, it's a new opportunity. So take advantage of that. And then always be switched on. So whether you're at the gym, whether you're doing, you know, you're walking down the street, always just be active in the way you're thinking. Because, you know, the person sitting next to you could be whoever. I was at brunch, and yeah, I was at brunch, I had like eight mimosas, but the dude next to me was a CTO of Square, right? And I'm just like, so like don't just fall on him and whatever, you know, talk to him and be ready to, to work on an opportunity. Um, and so what can go wrong? Absolutely everything. I told you my face got shattered and everything was going wrong. My car probably broke down. I don't know what else happened, but um, everything can go wrong. But everything that can go wrong, wrong will go wrong, which means that you can assert that. For those of you who do test-driven development, you can assert that everything will go wrong, and so you can test on that. Um, and so know that your first user is always going to be the worst user. You're going to be like, this is beautiful, this is amazing, and then someone's going to come in there and do it all wrong and say it doesn't work and then write the, the worst review ever. And so bank on that and know that's coming because it's, it's actually coming. So you have to meticulous, meticulously craft your success. And so you have to make sure you're trying to cover all the bases. And then when you don't cover those bases, make sure you have a catch all over here. Make sure there's somebody who's awake all the time for a terrible, a terrible message or a terrible tweet that's going to pop up, right? And then obviously, um, we got, it's out of my control, but many unfortunate events are going to be out of your control. And so, uh, you know, you're not, I couldn't stop the, 
guy from running into my face. It just happened, right? Um, there's all, I couldn't, the, the investor that pulled out, I couldn't stop that. Things are gonna be out of your control, so you have to be okay with it and stay calm. And this is what I, um, uh, the old uh, philosopher, thinker, Seneca, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So that's where I say, um, my Latin teacher from high school said, proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Uh, there was an extra P in there that is not PG-13, so it's six Ps for now. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's what I always think about, is always prepare, always prepare, always prepare. And always practice, practice, practice. Always think about what you're gonna be doing. Um, and and you know, try to think about the different ways that something can go wrong, like I said before. Um, again, plan with as much detail as you can without impeding progress. If you're just gonna keep planning, keep planning, keep planning, keep planning, keep planning, that's not gonna help. But if you plan and plan, you say, okay, I think I'm almost there. I think I've gotten a lot of planning done here. Let's go and try this. And that's, that, you know, try to find that balance. It's never gonna be um, a silver bullet for that balance. Um, planning is much less, less expensive. So if you're gonna go build a website and you're gonna draw a bunch of pictures on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper, you can get rid of that stuff really easily. But if you're gonna spend three weeks building a website and then all of a sudden it doesn't work the way you want it to work because you haven't looked at the user experience ahead of time, then that obviously costs you three weeks instead of three hours, right? And so, that, so that's a huge thing to think about is planning. Um, that's something I learned at Microsoft being a PM there. Uh, and then use focus groups uh, and user experience studies. Don't be afraid to test your food, as I say. You know, Gordon Ramsay is always like, test this, test that. Test your food. If someone says it's crap, okay, let's crap. That person perceives it as crap. Everyone else might think it's amazing, but that person right there has a perception. Then you start wondering, is that person a, a severe outlier or is that person a representation of something I'm not covering? So, you know, just because someone says it's crap and everyone else says it's good, you might, these might be all your friends who are afraid to tell you it's crap because you're 10, ten feet taller than them, right? So, you want to go and, and test, test, test with people you don't know. For that image software that we built, we bought pizza for as many college hires as we could, packed them all into a room, oh, and beer, lots of free alcohol for them. And, and we packed them into a room, and then we just had them just trash it, and they trashed it. <laughs> and they told us all kinds of stuff, and we were sitting there just like, man, we didn't go do this and that, but it worked. We got rid of the privacy issues, we got rid of the crawling issues, all that stuff because we asked for people to hurt our feelings. So. Um, preparation, it helps because then also your, your product won't fail um, or won't fail as badly as it might um, if you hadn't done those. And then again, look for feedback from anyone who wants to give it. It's any feedback at all. So the entrepreneurial reality. I like this picture because it's so true all the time. It's going to be a lack of sleep. I already didn't sleep very much, but I sleep on average nowadays two to four hours a night. Uh, I was sleeping, some days I would go 36 to 48 hours and then I'd crash and then go get up again. Crashing meaning I'd get six hours of sleep. And so my body was starting, you could see like changes happening and like I was getting like my, my, my abs, I lost my abs even though I was working out. It's just like your body just starts doing things. And so there's a balance issue that has to happen. Lack of money. There's going to be a lot of lack of money. Uh, I lived off of chili and eggs and I called it jardinier with eggs, which is these peppers from Chicago. Uh, I would put a bunch of jardinieres in the pot and put one, maybe two eggs if I could afford it. And so it was a whole bunch of jardinier and then, pe and then eggs. And so I lost about 20 pounds just like trying to build this, this company. And um, stress, obviously. And then people ask, how do you describe your job? I'm an entrepreneur, so you're a drug dealer. Like, no, I'm not. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, I got that so many times. And, and so people, parents, you know, it's, it's, it's stressful. Um, commitments and relationships. Uh, people, a lot of people are not gonna understand what you're doing. And that goes for significant others. And, and I tell people this, um, one of the students, the first day of class, she, sat, she asked me, she's really, she's my best student, I would say, one of my probably three best students. And she asked me, uh, you know, how do you balance your relationships and how do you balance, you know, don't you ever want to get married and this and that. And I was like, I made a decision and prioritized that my business came first. Because then I'd be okay to then go do other stuff and I'd have a foundation to build upon. But if I didn't have that and then someone decides they don't like me because my left foot got bigger, then, you know, what am I going to do, right? And so uh, commitments and relationships, it's, it's going to be hard. Uh, especially that's why as you get older it's gonna get harder because you're gonna have a relationship or you're gonna have a commitment that you have to be at all the time but then you have this business thing to do and you have to work and so you in my world and this is not perfect for everyone but I prioritize I say this is what I'm focused on and this comes second all the time except for these exce exceptions right and this comes next this comes next and people are gonna you know people will understand that if they're if they you know I don't know whatever people will get it if they don't whatever um, <laughs> 
<laughs> lots of lots of FOMO. Um, you know, my friends would be going out all the time, or I just didn't have money to go places with them because I I couldn't, and it sucked. But you know, at the end of the day, I had my goal and my priorities, and that's what I wanted to do. And so, and then failure and rejection becomes normal. I actually walked around college and practiced getting rejected because I was really bad at taking rejection. And so I went around and like asked people all the time just because I knew they would reject me. So I got really good at being rejected. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> I'll keep going, right? <laughs> and so, um, <laughs> and so that you get really good at that though because these investors are gonna, gonna give you some weird way of like, oh, well, I don't know, maybe later and this and that. And it's like, it's really close to dating, but uh, you know, but, but the rejection becomes normal, and so you have to be okay with rejection. You're gonna get rejected way more than you're gonna get accepted. Um, so kind of the place where that meets, where you have, for example, a co-founder who just kind of disappears off the face of the planet. Um, how do you deal with people who don't pull their own weight? You cut them. Like, there's a, the biggest thing is toxic, uh, people who are toxic to the company. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I made was not cutting someone who should have just been cut. Just, you're done, I gotta go. And it sucks, but it's business. And that's when people say it's just business. It's really just business. Like, I'm sorry, you didn't pull your weight. And so, you gotta go. Because I, I, need, I need that money and that equity. That's why you have to structure your equity and all that stuff at the, at the beginning really well so that you can cut that person and you don't lose 50% of the company. And so that's, you know, you just cut them. It's okay to be ruthless, if you will, uh, because it's your business, it's your baby. Right? If, 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 if you had a baby and the babysitter just stopped showing up, what are you going to do? Like, you're going you're gonna to cut the babysitter, right? And you're going to get a new babysitter because you have that in some agreement somewhere or whatever. So that's something. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to cut them. And there's all kinds of ways to cut them. You can, if the IP is not owned by anybody yet, and they, but they own 50% of the company, you can take that IP and walk it over to this other company. And then all of a sudden, you know, like, I, there's all kinds of things you can do that get shady. But if they're being shady, then. You know, so good question. Okay, question. Yeah. Oh, FOMO? Fear of missing out. Am I that old already? Man. Man, I have one gray hair. Um, it's fear of missing out. I saw the commercials. Yeah, fear of missing out. So if people are going out, having a good time, and you see them doing that, then all of a sudden you feel it's a fear that you're missing out. So. <laughs> So big questions that I get, how do you come up with a really good idea? I have an idea book. I have a set of several. I lost one, which freaked me out, and I got over it. But um, I write all my ideas down, because I think that everything that I keep in my head takes up brain space. And so I write it down, and I put it down. And I can also then share it with people. My friends and I have a shared OneNote. Uh, and we put a bunch of ideas, like one section is like take over the world and another section, a bunch of stuff. But we put stuff in there, and we see what fits. We st it sticks to the wall, right? And so. Uh, a lot of, you know, I've got students that will say, I can't come up with an idea. I'm like, ask your friends. People give out free ideas. They literally were like, you know what would be a good idea if you do this, this, and this? Okay, my laundry's done. And like, you can sit there and be like, I could build that in a weekend. And that, the, you, there's ideas that are just thrown around like that, that, you know, there's inspiration everywhere. So, um, also, when I travel uh, and I meet people in different countries and I see different cultures, it's a really good way to, to get um, new ideas for things. Um, with all the downside, how do you keep pushing forward? I don't know, but, uh, I'm kidding, but um, with all the downside, honestly, it's, the upside is I do what I, what I like, I do what I enjoy, and, and I wake up and I'm not frustrated. When I was at Microsoft, I'd wake up and it was like, oh man, I'm, I don't want to do this, and it was every day, and, but when I was doing the image thing at Microsoft, I was excited. And so with this, you know, with anything that you do with entrepreneurship, um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. If you're working hard, working smart, and, and being persistent and patient, it, you'll get something out of it. Um, whether it's learning something and being 20 times more valuable, just, you know, your business could fail, but all of a sudden you, you got really valuable after that. And then how do you get started? You literally just go start your business. <laughs> you literally just start a prototype. How important is the credential to get you in the room? How did the credentials to? The credentials. So, for example, you went to Carnegie Mellon. Mm -hmm. um, but how, Carnegie Mellon may or may not, however it is that you're passed back into Microsoft, Microsoft back to Bill Mitchell and all those people. Um, but there, there aren't necessarily, um, the credential gets you in the room in a lot of places. If you don't have those credentials, how do you get them? It can help. Um, I've got, uh, I mean, and How Howard's a really good school. I'll tell you, the, when I went to Bill Gates' house, I was with my friend from Howard, and he, 
he told me to stop asking questions about what the food was because it made me look ghetto. But <laughs> uh, <laughs> he's like, stop. But uh, but uh, but he met Gates. It wasn't even. I mean, he came from a really rough background, and and then he ended up. I mean, he's got his MBAs at Twilio now. But it's he's. It's again, it's the opportunity. Like the credentials might help get you uh, an opportunity, more opportunities. Just like going to Stanford might get you in the room more with more people. But there's other ways to get in those rooms. And sometimes, if you get, if you've gotten in through those other ways, it's better. Um, and so I, I would, you know, it's just all right. Well, I can't go through that door. So there's 30 other doors that probably might be more easily open too. You know, so. Um, but. Uh, so how does one get started? Uh, like I said, you just, uh, I mean, go out there and start putting your idea out there. Don't hide your idea from anybody. Just tell people. If your idea is a hard problem to solve, it's not going to get stolen. And all the ones that are easy to steal have already been done. So just tell people and you'll get feedback and they're going to give you free feedback. And so they're going to give you free ideas. And basically all this stuff is free. The internet's free. It's all free. So just like, just keep taking it in and, and you'll learn it. Um, so how do you get investors? Investors, depending on what you do, some might just come knocking on your door, but generally you go out there and just go talk to them. You have to take the initiative. You have to, I talk to like, I don't know, I'm gonna say upwards of 200 investors. I got no's for most of them, but that's, you know, you're, it's, like I said, it's, it's, you just put yourself out there and get those rejections and understand why they rejected you. They might, they might have to go put 90% of their money into, you know, again, underwater basket weaving and they can't put their money in there because they have, you know, so um, investors are there. But also the big thing is you don't always need investors. You can bootstrap, you can do all types of things and I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, so should I wait until I have a lot of money saved before taking a risk? I was broke, flat broke. So, and then even more broke with no face. So, um, you know, that you, it's up to you and you take those risks, but again, it's a risk. It's not a guarantee, it's a risk. You could lose everything and then have to go sleep on the street. I've slept in several airports because, it, you know, I, get, I book a flight, I'm like, oh, I could get a layover and book another flight and I have a place to sleep. Okay, this works. And then, you know, I've, I've gone to the gym in New York, you know, because I, I got 24 hour fitness, so I go to the gym there, take a shower, clean up, do work there, and that's my hotel for the night. And I keep going and I find a 24 hour diner. And so, you know, you figure things out, you get really creative, but, so the hard problem, I'll speed up a little bit. So the hard problem, um, an example of a hard or, or an easy problem. A hard problem, uh, for example, was the one that the connect thing. You know, so some people said, I want to make a better controller. He said, I'm just going to say no controllers. Uh, I'll use gestures. And so the easy problem was, let me just improve on something that's already there. So, you know, why go for the hard problem? We talked about that. It's, it's you know, it's more valuable and you're going to learn a lot more. You might not get it all the way done, but you're going to learn a lot more. And ultimately, solving a hard problem gives you a lot of intellectual property that you might be able to then get some value out of. Uh, and then how do you know that you're truly solving that problem? It's going to be something that someone hasn't done before uh, or that someone has failed at doing. Uh, and my, my company was doing scheduling software and everyone was saying scheduling software is bad, it's hard, it's this, it's that. And so we attacked the hard problem of making it easy to actually schedule, not making a pretty calendar, which everyone has done, that's easy. It's actually scheduling and trying to, everyone in here has had scheduling issues. And if you really think back into how you schedule something, it, with anyone, it, whether it's someone going to play basketball, it's one-on-one, -on -one, whatever it may be, it's hard. And so going to solve that problem, everyone glazed over it and went and just made a pretty calendar. And so we solved the actual scheduling issue. So to actually um, touch on how to go from uh, code to conquest, product development, what does it really take to succeed on a tech product? It's planning and relentless effort on it. And um, it, you have to really plan and really know your product really well. Just having a product or service doesn't mean you have a full company. A full company involves actually having these employees and worrying about their growth and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then how does successful growth happen within uh, your product? Yeah, that's something you think about again. When this product grows, when it scales, a simple example, we have a, a user list somewhere, right? And you have a user list in your interface. When this thing scales to 100,000 users and I'm, I need to list you know, someone who has 5,000 friends, what happens, right? Your, your app can't crash. And so that's, again, being a product development manager or a product manager, that's something you have to really think about. And again, that's the same with scaling. And so then, um, how do you compete against the big players out there? Now, the big players, again, when we were doing scheduling, the big players had pretty calendars and nice calendars, but when you're doing uh, again, we, we hit them and said they're not doing uh, the things that, that we know that we can do. The big players can't move as fast, the big players can't move, uh, as, they can't be as nimble, and they can't, uh, uh, they have more money, but they can't uh, actually focus as well as you think they can. They have so much bureaucracy that they, they trip over themselves. Um, 
Again, a couple of things I'll touch on. Uh, business development, what it means is really going out there, doing sales, getting yourself out there, making the money, figuring out how the money is gonna be made, figuring out how, how um, how you're going to respond to customers, respond to complaints, all those types of things, that's business development. You have to decide who's responsible for that because you have to have someone who knows what they're doing with that. And it's necessary the entire time, not at some point, and again, this involves marketing as well. It's not, it's not something you bring in at the end, you bring in marketing at the very beginning to figure out how to market your product from end to end. And then, uh, very important thing, financial planning. Money's involved. Um, and so I tell people bootstrapping is the best way to go. A lot of people ask about the investment rounds. Um, and again, if you have questions later, we can talk about those different investment rounds and what they mean. But uh, I've learned from my experience, I will never start a company again that is not bootstrapped. How did you bootstrap your uh, I didn't bootstrap back then. Oh, okay. Yeah, so my company was our first investor after we lost all that money, um, or after everyone pulled out. Mark Cuban, uh, we got in touch with Mark Cuban and Mark Cuban became our first investor. And uh, he's from Pittsburgh, so he, that was our way in. Um, so again, there's a different door. It wasn't Carnegie Mellon, it was Pittsburgh, right? So, um, yep. What, what is bootstrapping? Oh, bootstrapping is, again, it's pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, but it's, uh, it's basically using your own money and your own resources to build the business. Um, another friend of mine started Uber in China that, before it was Uber, it was, I can't remember what it was called, but it was exactly what Uber's doing. But he had 25 investors and they started bickering and the company failed. So he would have, his, his description says uh, almost an Uber billionaire, but it wasn't. It literally was the exact same thing. And so um, he bootstrapped his new company called JobScan. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of that. But he bootstrapped his new company and it's doing really well. So <clears throat> accounting, get a really good accountant. What I told my accountant was <clears throat> do whatever you want, just don't get me arrested. And, and so just get a really good accountant that you trust, sometimes get two to make sure they're doing this, the right thing and don't tell them about each other. Um, <laughs> I think Lil Wayne said that in one of his songs. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> taxes, make sure you pay taxes, the government will come after you. And then uh, employee costs and hidden costs that everyone forgets about. Employees cost money, they need computers, they need health insurance, they need bus passes, they need all kinds, they need chairs, they need blankets, they need bean bags, they need all kinds of stuff. They need a hug. So like, you, you there's so many costs that, that come with employees. And so that's something, again, don't skim over this stuff. If you don't know it, get someone who does, who can tell you about it. Um, Again, this is, legal planning is usually the most expensive, yet it's the most ignored, and it's actually the one that matters the most. So what we did is when we started, we gave a certain, we, got, we did deferred payment, and we allowed the uh, lawyer to choose whether they wanted a stake in our company, or we could deferred pay them, and they took the money, and they took the money and ran it first. But, uh, and so there's all types of ways you don't have to do, pay them straight up. You can also get friends to do things. Um, Intellectual property, it's critical to a tech business's success. You see what happened with uh, Google and Waymo and all that stuff, and Uber, uh, they, someone didn't do their job here and figure out, or they just didn't care and knew that it, they don't have billions of dollars and someone would throw $250 million around, right? So, but make sure you, you, you keep that in check, because investors will always want to know, and you might lose an investor because uh, they see an IP uh, and legal risk. Uh, and again, you can get an offensive trademark or defensive trademark. Again, I can talk about that later if you have questions after this presentation. Quick question, though. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people don't know if an idea is actually going to be a good idea. So mm -hmm. how, when do you actually get to the point where you spend some time patenting your idea versus actually trying it out and run the risk of someone stealing it? Uh, you test it. <clears throat> you test it with people. And so, again, like I was saying, if your idea, it, your, an idea is, is easily stolen, but it's the implementation of that idea that, that makes a difference, right? And so there was, there was um, uh, Facebook, or the Facebook, and there was Connect You, right? Two different implementations. Uh, Facebook just had a, a little bit less stuff on there, right? Same idea. Obviously, the idea was stolen, whatever, but he implemented it differently. And so he got, he won in the end, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so that's, I mean, it's, and then test it out and see if it's working. If it's working, then obviously you've got something. You can also do something called a provisional patent, and that costs $100, I believe, per uh, filing. And that'll, and I don't, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't wanna give too much, but like, that's what we did, and we did a bunch of provisional patents. We had a bunch on the board, and then only two were the ones that we actually are pursuing and spending a bunch of money on, so. And to build up the idea of that provisional patenting, um, companies will literally send out 200, 300, I work at the patent office, uh, companies will literally send out 200, 300 patents at a time to patent the concept. Um, and sometimes only two will be granted patents and the remaining 200, 298 just scrap. But off of those two, they're making millions. Okay. So if you think it's worth patenting, I'd look into it. Awesome.
All right, this is uh, towards the end here. So, uh, so what's an exit? <clears throat> so how do I get out of this, <clears throat> this whole business thing and how do I <clears throat> make money and get a yacht? It's all about yachts. So, <clears throat> Uh, the, so an exit, strategic plan to sell ownership of the company to an external buyer. That can be an IPO, which is offering shares of your company to the world or whoever's on that market. It could be what we did in getting acquired. It could be a merger. Uh, it could be completely imploding and running away. Um, lots of things, right? <clears throat> and so the best companies, though, are built to be self-sustaining. Oh, thanks. Um, they're built to be self-sustaining. And so that means that a... a uh, Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's a big cup. <laughs> I'm a big boy now. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, they're built to be self sustaining. If you think about uh, Whole Foods, Whole Foods is, was fine, right? But then Jeff Bezos is like, hey, how's it going? I got a whole bunch of money in a rocket ship. So, um, and so he comes and buys it. And because he has an idea to make Amazon more valuable with it. You know, Whole Foods might have been like, oh, we're fine, but if you want it for this much, then that's fine too. LinkedIn, same thing. Microsoft had an idea that they could use their stuff to make it even more valuable. So now LinkedIn uh, is, is part of Microsoft. And so there's various types of ex exits, like I said. Um, and then not all, all exits have a business reason behind them. If you watch uh, Suits, Suits, they've got a bunch of companies exiting because someone might be sick or someone might know that they're going to get in trouble soon so they need to run away and hide with money, right? Like there's all types of things that might happen uh, that cause an exit. And there might be some emotional aspect to it where someone just can't deal with it anymore and they just want to get rid of their company. And so it's not always uh, just a business reason. It's not always a logical reason. It's just sometimes people just want to get out of there. So. Um, with that being said, uh, thank you. I appreciate you guys sticking through all of that. And uh, I am here for any questions or anything like that. I've got a couple of decks that I, that I had in the past if you want to see those. But yeah, that's it.